I was actually descending on this because I said, actually, the good news is nobody ever aligned with corporate values. Yes? <laughs> um, because if they had, they'd have destroyed variety in the system and the system couldn't evolve. Yeah, it's hard to fact there. So we look at collect chaos. What matters in chaos is your ability to constrain. Yeah? Not only your ability to constrain, but your ability to know that you've gone into the space. Yeah? So basically, what we get here is it's known, it's knowable, it's unknowable. Yeah, so noble means we know how to discover it if we need to. Unknowable means we've got no bloody idea. Yeah. And basically, on the other dimension, it's basically fundamentally on this. Yeah, um, we go with deliberate intent. It's plausible it could happen, or it's actually unimaginable it could happen. Right? Got the principle? Now, most people keep chaos as one bucket. Actually, it's more sophisticated. This is good. This is deliberately relaxing all the constraints, knowing you can impose them to create novelty. This is also good. Yeah? It's plausible it happened, we planned for it, we know what to do, we can respond accordingly. This is kind of like good. We didn't expect it, but we know what to do. And that actually gives you a huge opportunity for innovation. One of the simplest things you can do is to have an innovation team which triggers it in parallel with the crisis management. Because during the crisis, you can change things after the crisis you can't. Mm. And so that's building process in advance. They can't have all of those, they come like, okay, they're cute. This one is just plain really stupid. Uh, Duffers is a British Navy swan. <laughs> yeah, it, it's basically for people who try hard but keep getting things wrong. There's a famous telegram in British literature which is about kids who want to go for a holiday on the lake. And the father sends a telegram back and it says, if not, Duffers won't drown. If duffers, better drown. <laughs> and that actually inspired me as a kid to the point where my management strategy now is if people want to work with me, I'll take them to the swimming pool, throw them in, go and have a cup of coffee. If they're still swimming, they're worth working with. Uh, and that's actually quite a good way of doing, doing employees at the employee testing. So basically, you don't want that. It's stupid. So if you enter this space, yeah, fundamentally, you test the constraints fast. Otherwise, you can sit down with that. Yeah, that's the test the bike brakes yeah, before you have a few drinks and before you actually test it at high speed. Yeah, so For some reason, my wife wouldn't come out and collect me. I thought it was very unfair. I know she was seven months pregnant, but that's not an excuse. <laughs> okay, this stuff is now starting to get dangerous. It's plausible it to happen, but what we plan to do doesn't work anymore. So we're now increasingly at this point starting to take centralized control. Yeah? Because we haven't got time, it's the last chance to live. Over here, this is kind of like worrying. It was unimaginable, and it's unknown, and we're frantically struggling. We might find the solution, but we're not sure. Again, centralized control. Down here, it was unimaginable, so it was plausible, and we got no idea what to do. Well, the only strategy on that is to go to the local church, light some candles, and pray for the Blessed Virgin. Right? So I'm a Catholic, you can take your other options. Yeah. This one actually is good. If it's completely unplausible and you've got no way of doing it, you've got an opportunity to change. Two people will hang on at this point, they don't break their class. Now you see what I'm doing with both of these models? I haven't gone to the complicated and the obvious, there's models for that as well. It's basically to say, where am I, what sort of thing I should do, which is the equivalent of giving a cook, a cook having a guide to taste. It's not a recipe book. Yeah, and we're trying to create chefs, not recipe book users. So that's the complex model. And of course, simple or obvious collapses into it. And again, narrative, we define that boundary with exemplar narratives of what happened in the past, so we can monitor its occurrence to trigger things in. Narrative defines boundaries that are a key technique. And that's actually another version of kinetic. And we're actually having that made as stress balls at the moment, because it actually goes around and covers. So finally, to finish off on this, because I'm coming to the end of my time, this is something we're now doing on narrative. This is a culture scan. So you've all filled out an employee satisfaction survey at some stage in your life. Yeah. We used to get an idea. They used to come and say, does your manager consult you on a regular basis, get a zero not at all, ten all the time? You know what the answer is. <laughs> so I found the picture and I got straight through to the top. Um, I'd actually run a six-month program which had proved that astrology was more accurate than Myers-Briggs in predicting team behavior. <laughs> and for some reason, they didn't like me very much as a consequence, all right? And they suppressed the paper, right? So I'm about that, right? 
Um, either way, so I got to the job and I said, how do I address this? I've got several managers, some of them consult me, some of them don't. Sometimes they should, and sometimes they shouldn't. And she said, average your experience over the year. And then you claim to be in charge of a research group? <laughs> yes, that's about research. We do something different. We go to every employee all the time, or 10% of the employees once a month, or whatever sequence you can get away with. And we say to them, you want continuous scanning. We don't want that once a year trauma of the big report, and nobody understands it, and consultants tend to cost your fortune. Yeah. We go to 10% of the workforce every month, in this case, and say, tell a story about the position, which for you summarizes what it's like to work for this company. Yeah, that's a non-hypothesis question, and it focuses on decisions, because decisions are where reality hits the road. Abstract by are. And then they index it on six triangles. This is one. Was the decision analyzed logically? Did people act intuitively? Or did they make the decision based on raw principles? Now you'll notice something about this. You don't know what the right answer is. So it engages the novelty receptive part of the brain, which only clicks in when actually you can't go on automatic pilot. So people will scroll around six trials and determine where to place it, whereas with the car scales, they'll just go across. Also, the three values are positive. So you don't know what the right answer is. You're not being asked to evaluate in a negative, positive sense. You're just describing what skew it is. Yeah? So again, you've got more description, less evaluation. And this is actually the result from one of the trials. This is now going out to $2,000 to the company for a month, right? Really cheap to do some about it. This actually, the color coding is by department. This company has got a real problem under uncertainty. Because overall, its decisions are focused on analytic and principle based, it's not little intuition. So now, what does HR get target done? Next time we run this, I want more stories up there and fewer stories down there. That's an impact target. They can't gain it, they've actually got to change behavior. And that's actually a big approach now in terms of employees scanning and everything else. So that's a really simple map of the way things work. We also use this to measure attitudes. This is stuff we're doing for one big manufacturing company at the moment. On this scale, this is taking stuff from two triangles, and this is workers keeping notes constantly as they do their jobs in the factory. Uh, which is easy to do because we make it easy by giving them apps so they don't have to write reports, so they do it voluntarily. So this scale measures adherence to principles, this getting the job done. So what they really want is all the stories up there. We follow the guidance and we get the job done. Well, you notice the problem here? People have given up. They really have genuinely given up. A few people are still getting the job done, but they're not following the rules. Now the interesting thing when we then map attitudes, if we look at positive and negative stories, we'll see that negative stories are either rule compliant, focus on rules, or focus on getting the job done, whereas actually positive stories are all about getting the job done and ignoring the rules. <laughs> yeah? And that's actually quite scary. This now, these models are now running continuously and taking triggers to senior management to tell them something's going wrong. Because actually, attitudes is a lead indicator, whereas compliance is a lag indicator. We do the same with customer facing staff and everything else. It's a very powerful technique because it allows you to see what's going on, and that maps dispositions, not goals. Yeah. Again, that's a powerful technique. So, coming on to specific HR stuff, and I'm winding up now, I'm just going to run through these strips. I kind of like using the Gate and Boy cartoon there, right? We, we need to focus on the outliers, right? And yeah, we don't paint them red with their own blood, which is normal HR of you, which is respect them for what they do. This is a fee, personally, I've right? been that by all my life. So, employee engagement monitoring. I'm just giving that as an example. Uh, when I do some more interesting work, we've got a water company in the UK, we've got engineers actually recording anomalies, and you know, we put their workbooks onto the computers. So they've got a triangle which says it smells wrong, it tastes wrong, it feels wrong. So they can take a picture, put it onto that triangle. We've actually increased by a factor of 14 in the amount of input error reports because before they had to say what it was. Now they can report it ambiguously. Doing the same with development workers in Africa and elsewhere. So basically, engage monitoring 360. Anybody do 360 feedback? Yeah. Again, a big annual problem. Right, we've got a system now by which an executive nominates any number of employees they want without restriction. The employees tell stories about them on whatever time frame is defined. They index it down to only positive triangles, and the executive can look at the skew on the triangle 
and say, what can I do to have more stories told like this and fewer stories told like that? So you get immediate real-time engagement, and we allow people to withhold the stories if the executive sees all the stories withheld. That tells them something as well. Rather than big annual trauma, continuous feedback. Um, the leadership development journals did this with the board of the company. Everybody going through the leadership program has to keep a daily diary of what, what the leadership doing. But then every two weeks, the CEO sends them a request for a postcard home on a subject. So it could be go and interview somebody you respect in the past. Go and find out about this. And that creates a knowledge base. Yeah? It actually creates a learning journal to go with executive development, which can become something we can use downstream. We're also now using this to assess the degree to which the leader has changed as a result of the program, or whether they actually haven't changed. Yeah, and that's actually a form of assessment. And for a simulation, there was a human-mediated game by which executives are put into a situation for a day by which whatever they do, they fail. Training executives to succeed, they learn nothing. Putting them in situations where they constantly fail, they learn a lot. And also, by the way, they enjoy it. It happens in parallel. That's called actual simulation. Affinity mapping. Giving executives, well, let's give the example, we gave American commanders stories indexed by Afghanistan people and asked them to index them the way they called Afghanistan people would index them. If it was different, we threw more challenging ones, and if they still couldn't see it, they weren't deployed. Yeah, so actually seeing how people index material, giving them a chance to look at the difference, talk about it, try and resolve it, is the way you match affinity for people before you deploy them into different fields. Again, that comes from the narrative side. Attitudinal mapping I've shown you. Social network simulation I haven't gone through. Rudolf can tell you about that if you want to speak into the training. That's a technique which basically you give people intractable problems, they self-assemble teams within rules in return for rewards like sabbaticals or company-funded education. Within two years, everybody is within three degrees of separation of everybody else having worked on a team. And that's called resilience. You're creating a network capability to respond fast. Cross silo serendipity. That's gathering material within silos with those high abstraction indexes. Then merging the data as an index data so you can see sudden associations between ideas. We created two huge new businesses for a lifetime term in Europe on that. We got everybody in the technical silos to index their data. We got customers to index their stories. We matched the databases together, got five clusters, marked and looked at the clusters, three of them became businesses by moving existing technology sideways into novel use. In biology, that's called hex adaptation yeah, in terms of the way it works. Uh, crews, not teams, that's one of the big new things. Because you can look, but when people go into a crew, their entry into the crew is highly ritualized. So the team can perform straight away without team formation. Yeah, it's kind of a one to two year training period, but once you've got that, you can very quickly assemble people. And you should be getting a sense in them. In complexity, you build capability before you need it, not when you know what's needed. Yeah, and crews are one of the ways to do that. Um, any workforce knowledge work. Getting young people to follow old people around and keep diaries. I've just given you an example. Yeah, mentioned that's the way you capture knowledge. You don't get them to write down what they know and put them on databases. You do continuous narrative capture. And the interesting thing is that carry on keeping the device and telling the narrative after they retire. And that's also useful in terms of the works. I could go through some more, right? Uh, but that's kind of like the principle. I'm not going to go through this, but you can have it. This is kind of like nature of the situation, what do we do? Yeah. And the final point to make on this, this is from Peter Drucker. And I'll tell you the story of this. I, I was at a conference in San Diego, I wanted to go back in San Diego on Monday, I'm not looking forward to Saturday or Sunday. I leave here at 7 a.m., drive to Heathrow, go to the car park, swap a few suitcases over, and then go to San Diego. Right? So obviously not going to be anything. Um, but I met, I was at keynote at the conference and I spoke before Drucker. I was quite proud of this. I was on a keynote platform with Drucker. It saved my life in IBM. You know, Lou Gerson saw a picture of me plus Peter Drucker plus somebody else and said, who is this person? Exactly half an hour before some of my enemies went in saying I had to be fired. So that worked for me quite well. I didn't know management. Either way, so I, was, I rubbish scientific management. I was the only naive in those days. And then I had the benefit of the 93-year-old genius doing the I knew Peter Drucker. Boy, yeah, story. Is that sorry, I knew Frederick Taylor's story. And after I sort of melted into a pool of humiliation, he decided to take me out for dinner and decided I was redeemable. So I actually ran three leadership training courses with him before he died. I learned a lot. 
One of the things I learned is actually scientific management got a lot of things right. It understood long-term employment for key staff. It understood apprentice things. When I first began as general manager, I had to do a year in sales, a year in production, a year in supporting my targets before I was even allowed to go on the general management program. Now we have people do BAs, followed by MBAs, followed by working consultancies, and then we move them sideways into management, and all they know is how to manage by spreadsheets and plans. <laughs> yeah, they've got no bloody idea about the reality of the work they're in. So actually we're now saying scientific management focused on physical augmentation, but respecting human judgment. System thinking attempts you to replace it. It did a lot of good things, but it got that wrong. Complexity thinking focuses on cognitive augmentation, but relies on human judgment. And that's the next generation. And I hope, I've tried to persuade you, it's not hopeless, it actually is not too difficult. Complexity is really very, very simple when you recognize it's different. Thank you very much for your time.